And he was a slave trader whose life had been turned around by Christ, as you heard in the sketch. Now, centuries earlier, another man had his life turned around by Jesus, and it was a man named Onesimus. Onesimus. He was a slave. He was owned by a Christian man named Philemon. And he managed to escape and run away from his home. But during his journey away from home, he met with Paul, who was the great evangelist of the early church. Paul led him to Jesus. And so Paul writes this beautiful little letter to Philemon to say, take this man back, take Onesimus back, and he's changed, he's been saved by grace. So let's read those verses and then we'll take it from there. Your love, Paul says to Philemon, has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. We spoke about that last week, you might remember. And so he says, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps, Paul says, the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. We read today and we thank God for his word today. Let me ask you a very simple question. Has Jesus saved you? Now that's a term that the modern church doesn't like. I remember when I was studying uh, in one of my subjects, they said, you don't want to use the word saved anymore. It's very like, it puts people off, gives people the wrong idea. You know, it's, it's, you should rather avoid that term. And I, I understand the thinking. Terminology gets outdated. Right? Things that meant one thing 20 years ago mean something else today in our vocabulary. And so the thinking there was that sort of terminology doesn't work in today's world. But I disagree. I believe the term saved is a good one. I think it's one that every Christian should, should love and should keep in our vocabulary in the 21st century because the crux of the gospel, the bottom line of the Christian story is that God's grace saves wretches like you and me. Sinners like John Newton, who we just heard about. Sinners like Onesimus. Sinners like Paul and Philemon. Sinners like you and me, saved by grace. That's the good news of Jesus. In fact, do you remember when the angel announced to Joseph that his fiancée was pregnant? This is what the angel said to Joseph. She, that is Mary, will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, that's what it was about. This man is going to save people. So we can't throw that word out of our vocabulary. Let me ask you again. Has Jesus saved you from your sins? This is really at the heart of the Philemon letter in the New Testament. It's a letter that has a lot to tell us about salvation. And so I want to... Show us today how it does this. And as you listen prayerfully this morning, I hope that you get a renewed sense of wonder of the saving grace of God. I mean, we've sung it. Did you notice it? We sang mighty to save. We sang salvation belongs to our God. It's all been building up to letting us be amazed at God's grace that saves sinners. Let me say this first of all. Salvation is for everybody. God can save even the worst rich through his grace. It's for the rich and poor. It's for the young and the old. It's for black, white, colored, every race. It's for you. It's for me. It's for every person that you'll ever lock eyes with on this planet. God's grace is for all of us. And you know what? We know this in our heads. <laughs> but often it doesn't reach our hearts. Verse 10 of Paul's letter said this. I appeal to you. For my son Onesimus, who became my son, in other words, he became saved, that's what he was saying, while I was in chains. Now, in the original Greek, the name Onesimus came at the end of that sentence. And so it probably went something like this. 
uh, I appeal to you concerning a son of mine who became my son while I was in chains, Onesimus. And when Philemon read that line and he got to that name, he would have gone, what? He would have done a double take. He would have said, hey, Onesimus, that nasty little slave who's run away from me, him of all people? In his mind, this was the, the, least, the last person God would ever want to save. But God's salvation is for all. Nobody can say, I'm too much of a rich for God to save. And hear this, nobody can say, that person is too much of a rich for God to save. I hope you know this today. In our country, there's lots of tension between people. Racial tension, tribal tension. Most of us have got tension at work, maybe even in our families. It's hard for us at, time to, at times to see every person as somebody worthy of God's grace. In fact, a little while back, I was speaking to somebody who had been deeply hurt. This person was struggling to forgive the person who had hurt their family so terribly. And in our conversation, this person said to me, I cannot see how this man is worthy of God's forgiveness after what he's done. And I remember saying, well, he's not. But the truth is, neither am I. And the truth is, neither are you. God's grace is not based on our worthiness. It's based on his love. In fact, there's a verse in the Psalms, I don't even think I put it up, that says, Lord, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? If you kept a record of sins, who could stand? In other words, not one of us could stand before God confidently because of our sin. Even the best person you can think of has got sin that separates them from God. And so a wretch like me and a wretch like him, the person who my friend was talking about, and a wretch like anybody can come to God in repentance and find grace. It's for everybody. Last week we spoke about being Philemon-like in our faith, if you remember. Let's not be shocked like he obviously was when he saw that word Onesimus, when we hear of of people being saved by God's grace. Let's rejoice. And friends, if you feel unworthy, maybe you feel, I'm too far from God. I've, I've done too many bad things. You know, I, I've got shame that God wouldn't understand. Friends, think again if you think God couldn't love you. Because even the worst person in this world can be saved by God's grace. My friend Darren once wrote a song which said this, no matter how far you've run, no matter how far you've run, turn around and see God's son. His love is bigger than your biggest wrong. His love is bigger than your biggest wrong. Salvation is for all. Anybody who comes acknowledging their sin and seeking God's forgiveness can find it. Has God been knocking at your door lately, I wonder, drawing you into himself? I think he probably has. God has a way of revealing himself to you time and time again until you realize that it's him that's doing it. He offers salvation. I want to say this today. Secondly, he's got salvation offered for all. Listen to what Paul said to Philemon. He said, perhaps the reason that he, Onesimus, was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. Paul was saying, maybe God used your slaves running away to save him. Maybe God was at work in his actions, even though you didn't see it. Maybe that was the only way God was going to work in Onesimus' life, was to, was to get him out of there and get him speaking to somebody else who would lead him to Christ. Think back on your own life for a minute. Can you see how God used all your little decisions, all your twists and turns, to actually point you to him? Can you see how everywhere you went, God was there with an outstretched hand to you? And even though you tried to outrun him, you couldn't. He was there. He was reaching out to you. I can see Onesimus trying to outrun God, trying to get away, and yet God was there. God was there with an outstretched hand, and he eventually took it. Maybe some of us need to hear this today. Maybe you've had somebody in your life run away from you in a sense, like Onesimus ran away from Philemon. A sibling, a friend, a child. They've lost their way, so to speak, and you're, you're wondering what God is doing. Can I remind you that God is with that person? 
even if they don't know it yet, reaching out his hand to them. Can I remind you that there is hope for those who have run away because God is reaching out to them and they can accept his help at any moment. In theology terms, we call this prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. It's God working in our lives even though we're not aware of it. So we're not even looking for him, but he's already got grace working in our lives with an outstretched hand to each of us. Maybe as you sit here today, you're realizing God's outstretched hand has been there in my life. He's been, he's been close to me all along, but I've been resisting it. I've kept him at a distance. Maybe you've even come to church and done all the church things, but you've never actually taken his hand. You've always kind of kept him at a distance. Maybe God has been leading you to this moment. Like he did with Onesimus. Clearly used all these things to lead him to Paul so that he could make that step in faith. But you've got to accept the offer, friends. Have you seen this famous picture of Christ? Oh, it's very dark. Maybe you can't see it so well. It's a painting called Christ the Light of the World by William Holman Hunt. Sean, could you knock off the lights for a second there, please? Just above you, so we can hopefully get a better look at it. Here we go. It's a famous painting of Jesus at a door, knocking on a door. Can you see that? And it's based on a verse in Revelation where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever will open the door and let me in, I will enter and eat with that person. This is a picture of God's offer of salvation. Do you notice there's no handle on the outside of the door? Jesus is not the type to throw the door open and come in and start beating you around with the Bible, you know. Christ is not that way. He doesn't work that way. He knocks on the door and he waits with an offer of salvation, with an offer of, of friendship. He wants to come in and be in your life and walk with you and eat with you and be part of your life. But you need to accept and you need to open that door from the inside and let him in. Think of it. Onesimus could have come to Paul and Paul explained all of this to him and he said, no thanks. I hear what you're saying, but not for me, not for me. He could have gone on his way and resisted that offer of salvation. Many of us do that. Many of us, God is right here knocking, knocking, outstretched hand, to use the two different metaphors or pictures. And we kind of stay, stay just a little bit far away from him. But Onesimus didn't. He responded to that truth. He was saved. He became Saved by Jesus' grace and it changed everything as we will see. Will you respond to God's outstretched hand today? Will you take it? Will you take it and let him in? To those who do receive God's offer, everything changes. That's the last point today, number four. Salvation changes everything. Thanks, Sean. Paul wrote this about the newly saved Onesimus. Formerly he was useless to you. But now he's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me. I would, like to, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. Paul meant that in the mission of Christ, Onesimus wasn't involved. He had no place because he wasn't saved. But then he came to Christ and his life changed. He, he had a new purpose and I, I, I believe Paul was saying, you'll hardly recognize this man, Onesimus. He, he's not the same anymore. You can take him back. He's not the slave that you once remembered. He is made new. He once was blind, but now he sees. Paul said, I wish I could just keep him here because he's doing such great work now. But I want him to go back to you. I wondered to myself, I wondered to myself if Onesimus, with a heart full of God, didn't say to Paul, send me back. I've got, I've got stuff to make right with Philemon. I've got to go and sort out what I've done. Because he was changed. God's grace had altered the way that he saw everything. Sometimes God calls us to go new places when we're saved. Sometimes God calls us to go back to the very places we came from. But either way, God's, all, God's salvation always changes us so that we can do the work that God wants us to do. You see, salvation does not just mean a ticket to heaven. Some people think that's all that salvation is. It's like getting a ticket to the show, right? You've got a show that's booked months in advance. You get your ticket. Cool. 
Now all I've got to do is show up at the gate with my tickets. That's my only responsibility. Many people see the Christian salvation story as that. I've got my ticket, I can show up at heaven's gate, and I'll get in. But there's far more to it to, to there's far more to it than that. Jesus came to save his people, and that means three things. I want to share three Ps with you about salvation. Hope you'll remember these. He saves us, number one, from the punishment of sin. Instead of us wallowing in guilt and shame and awaiting God's wrath, instead of us being fearful of what God might do to us if we step out of line, we are cleansed. God saves us from the punishment of sin that we rightfully should have. Have you experienced this? Has God washed away those guilt and those stains in your life so that you now don't live in fear and, and you don't worry about God's punishment anymore in your life? What a wonder to be saved from God's punishment. That's wonderful. But note this, he also saves us from the power of sin. The punishment of sin and the power of sin. Without a work of God in our hearts, without his saving grace, we're just slaves to our sinful nature. We just keep doing evil things. We keep sort of looking out for ourselves only. We're number one in our lives. But when God saves us, suddenly the things that used to hold us down are broken. Did you hear us sing, my chains are gone just now? That's because when God saves somebody, their chains are broken and they can live holy and loving lives through his grace. And then lastly, when we die, we will be freed from the presence of sin. One day, we'll get to the place where there is no more sin. But now we still live in an evil world surrounded by darkness, of course. Lives are changed when God saves people in this way. Lives are changed when people's People's lives or lives are changed when people aren't afraid of these things anymore. When the punishment of sin isn't a factor anymore. When the power of sin isn't as strong in your life. And when the presence of sin will one day disappear. Let me ask you, have you been saved <laughs> from these things? And maybe you're sitting here thinking, I've been saved years ago. You know, this is one of those sermons that I don't really need to listen to. Well, do you still marvel at this in your life? Do you still marvel at the fact that God doesn't punish you and has given you power in your life and will one day save you from the presence of sin? Does that amaze you? When you hear amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, does it, does it resonate with you so deeply that you have to worship? Can you sit through a message like this and have your heart soar in gratefulness because you know exactly what I'm talking about? Or have you not get, gotten there yet? Maybe you haven't gotten there yet and you need to take that step. You need to find the saving grace at work in your life. Onesimus made his way back to Philemon changed. Paul said, no longer a slave but a brother. He was no longer a slave and in a spiritual sense there's a kind of a metaphor here. He was no longer a slave to his old ways but he was now a child of God. And so are you going to return home today still a slave? of your old life or are you going to return home today saved saved from sin in these ways through God's grace a little illustration to close here a steamship called the Central America was once on voyage from New York to San Francisco but they got a leak in the mid-ocean and so another vessel sort of realized that they were in distress and they came towards the Central America ship and the captain of the rescue ship shouted out, let me, let me take your passengers on board, right? Let me, let me come and help. But it was night time. The, the darkness had just settled in. And so the, the commander of the Central America said, I don't want to do that in the dark. It's too dangerous. Let's just wait until it's light. And then we can do that. Two hours later, the ship had sunk because the situation was so dire. And everybody on board died because they thought they could be saved later. What are you waiting for, friends, I wonder? What are you waiting for? Don't wait for a better time if God is speaking you, to you today. In fact, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians. He said, God says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, and now, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. 
It's God speaking to you today. God is longing to save every Onesimus in this place, and that's all of us. To fill us with joy and to make us new. Or if we've already been through it, to rekindle the fire that we once enjoyed. And so we're going to spend some time in prayer now, and I hope that you are going to open your heart to God and just allow him to minister to you with his saving grace. Let's pray together. Lord, we see ourselves in Onesimus today. We see ourselves slaves to sin, running away from you, resisting you perhaps. But today you have met us here with an offer of salvation. We need your salvation, Lord. We need to have the grace that you offer in our lives. Too long, too long we've lived with shame and guilt, fearing your punishment. Too long we've lived powerless lives, defeated by our sins. Too long we've wondered about our eternal fate and been afraid of death. But you have come and offered us salvation from these things. If we'll open up that door and take your hand. And so, Father, in this moment, we want to do that. We state it now. Lord, I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus, my savior. Nothing else can wash away my stains. Nothing else can empower me for the life I long to live. Nothing else can secure my eternal life. I trust in you, Jesus, and you alone as my savior. Forgive me, Lord. Free me, Lord. Fill me with your spirit, Lord, I pray. And I believe, oh, I hope you'll pray this with me, friends. I believe that you've done this in my life now, Lord. From now on, you'll be number one. From now on, you are on the throne of my life. Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you for your saving love, Lord. And I pray that in this moment, you have changed lives. And I pray, Lord, that we will now live as those who are free because of your saving grace. Thank you, Lord, for saving Onesimuses like us even now. Amen.